Welcome back everybody to part three of this risk adjusted return series. And in this video, I'm going to talk about maximum drawdown. I feel like this is one of the most overlooked aspects of long-term risk management. Occasionally, I will hear people talk about the Sharpe ratio, which we covered in part one of this video series. And for more experienced investors out there, the Ulcer Performance Index may come up as well. That was part two of the series. But rarely will I hear people acknowledging the maximum drawdown, which is a shame because it's actually a major influence on people's trading decisions, whether they acknowledge it or not. It's still influencing our decisions. So let's talk about what it means for us. Before we get into the reasons why avoiding major drawdowns is so important to long-term investing, we first need to quickly go over what maximum drawdown means. We need to define it. This is a 10-year chart of the S&P 500. So if we want to calculate the maximum drawdown during this 10-year period, we can see that on October 9th of 2007, the S&P 500 had a closing price of 1565.15. On March 9th of 2009, it closed at the low of 676.53. The maximum drawdown is the percentage move from peak to trough, from the high to the low during that time period. And in this case, it's 56.78%. And as it happens for the S&P 500, this nearly 57% drawdown during the financial crisis was the largest drawdown since the Great Depression. So that's what the maximum drawdown is. It's easy enough to calculate, but why is it so important for investors to try to minimize them as much as possible? Well, today I'm going to give three reasons, and the first one is a simple math reason. Some people may look at that chart of the S&P 500 and think, well, sure, granted, 57% drawdown wouldn't have been very much fun, but I'll just make 57% in the next year or two and make up for it, right? But is that really how it works? Here's a simple table showing in the left column the drawdown percentage suffered, and in the right column, the percent gain required to get back to the break-even point. You can see in this case of a 10% drawdown, you actually need an 11% gain to get back to break-even. No big deal, right? If you lose 10%, you need to make 11% to recover. With a 25% drawdown, it gets a little harder. Now you need a subsequent 33% gain to reach that break-even point. And a 33% return is no easy feat. Studies show that the average fund manager out there only achieves about 5% a year or so in the long run. So needing a 33% return just to break even may take a little longer than people are comfortable with. After suffering a 50% drawdown, now it's really an uphill battle requiring a full 100% gain just to break even. Even the S&P 500, which after the financial crisis, had a very strong recovery and is now in the second longest bull market in history, it still took four years to recover that drawdown. And if you adjust for inflation, it took six years to recover from the financial crisis. So you can see where I'm going with this. It requires a 300% gain to recover from a 75% drawdown. But now I'm just getting silly, right? A 75% drawdown? But actually not really. The NASDAQ index suffered a 78% drawdown in the dot-com bust. And it took over 15 years to recover to the same price. And if you adjust for inflation over those years, as of now in June of 2017, 17 years later it's still not back to the break-even. The inverse volatility ETN XIV suffered a 74% drawdown during the European sovereign debt crisis. But that was only on an 18% S&P 500 drawdown. When the next recession comes, things may get a lot worse than that. And this 90% drawdown category is certainly possible on a product like the XIV. As you can see, this is not a linear relationship, and this is why sometimes I say that losses are more costly to a fund than gains are beneficial. It's just a math problem. Things get exponentially worse with larger drawdowns, and the amount of time and the rate of return required to recover gets pretty daunting. Reason number two is an emotional one, and it has to do with what I call preserving emotional capital. Sometimes raw numbers don't tell the whole story. Rates of return, start value, end value, performance metrics, they can underestimate the emotions involved with investing. Let's take a hypothetical example of two investors. They both turned their $10,000 into $20,000 over the same 10-year period. So from a rate of return perspective, they're equal. Investor A is conservative and actively seeks out safer strategies that try to reduce drawdowns. Investor B is aggressive and only looks at the rate of return. Looking at this chart, which investor do you think sleeps better at night? Which one will have more confidence in the decisions they've made? In year 11, 
Both of these investors need to make portfolio allocation decisions. We all do. Since investor A has preserved more of their emotional capital by not putting themselves through all those gut-wrenching drawdowns, when future decisions need to be made, investor A is more likely to be calm, rational, and make logical decisions. Even though after 10 years, both investors ended up at the same place, I would submit that investor A has a much higher probability of success going forward for the next 10 years. So we should never underestimate the importance of emotions when investing. And trying to avoid major drawdowns is a great place to start. And the third reason to avoid major drawdowns is just a practical one. If you look at long-term charts for indexes, individual stocks, broad asset classes, and various trading strategies out there, you'll oftentimes notice that the periods of the best performance are immediately following periods of poor performance. Here's the S&P 500 again, but this time over the last 20 years. You'll notice the periods with the steepest upward performance, the best gains, are immediately following the drawdowns. But if an investor doesn't have the risk tolerance to sustain those drawdowns, they'll pull the plug, they'll exit their position, and they won't be there for the subsequent recovery. So it doesn't matter if it makes 100 or 200% afterwards. If the investor has already abandoned the strategy, whatever happens after that is irrelevant. Now I'm not a buy and hold investor, of course. I trade a diversified portfolio of tactical strategies. But the same thing applies to me. Sometimes my best months are immediately following some of my worst months. So that's why I focus so much on risk management and reducing drawdowns. If we keep them reasonable, then investors can stay the course and they can benefit from the subsequent performance. But that does beg the question, what is a reasonable level of drawdown? Unfortunately, all investors have different levels of risk tolerance, so there is no one-size-fits-all answer here. But one very important point that I want to make is that risk tolerance itself is not linear either. That is to say, the difference between a 40% drawdown and a 20% drawdown isn't just twice as bad. It's not a simple one-to-one -one relationship. So if risk tolerance was a linear relationship, it would look something like this. On the bottom, the x-axis, we have the drawdown percentage. And on the left, the y-axis, we have the probability of an investor abandoning the strategy. So if it was linear, you can see that a 30% drawdown would mean the investor has about a 30% probability of exiting the strategy. A 50% drawdown means they'd be about 50-50. They might stay, they might leave. But in reality, it doesn't work this way. This chart is a lot closer to what it's actually like in the real world of live trading. So after a 10% drawdown, most investors know this is completely normal, so the probability of abandoning the strategy is very low. A 20% drawdown? Again, there's very few strategies that don't see that from time to time, so the probability of leaving may still be fairly low. But going from 20% to 30%, that's a significant jump. It's getting pretty uncomfortable at this point, and we may see about a third or so of people leaving. Down just 10% more to a 40% drawdown, at this point over half the people may be reaching their limit. And past 50%, there may not be anybody left. So this is hypothetical, of course, but it's a much more realistic picture of risk tolerance. Every 5 or 10% more a strategy draws down, it becomes exponentially more likely that the person exceeds their limit. So hopefully this video helps you understand why that maximum drawdown metric is a lot more important than a lot of investors realize. The math reason, the time and the rate of return required to recover becomes exponentially larger the deeper those drawdowns get. The emotional reason, investors that preserve their emotional capital may be better equipped to make sound investing decisions going forward. And the practical reason, there's few things more costly in the long run than when investors pull the plug and exit positions right in the heart of a drawdown. Making sound investing decisions is about a lot more than just rate of return. That's why we're trying to expand our toolbox here. We've got the Sharpe Ratio, the Ulcer Performance Index, and now we have the Maximum Drawdown. Coming up in part four of this Risk Adjusted Return series, I'm gonna talk about correlation to the S&P 500. So stay tuned for that one. See you next time. So go ahead and click the link right here, sign up for the VTS newsletter, and when you do, you're going to get full access to all three of my trading strategies for a full two weeks absolutely free. And if you are new here, please consider subscribing to my channel. Also, if you have any questions or comments, I'd love to hear from you. So go ahead and leave those in the comment section. See you next time.